Hey everyone and welcome to another installment of Board Games Hitting My Table. This is for the first half of March 2022. So the first game that I've been playing is some more Anno 1800 by Martin Wallace. Uh, this one was a game that I played when it first came out quite a bit and then um, since then I've not really gone back to it and played it anymore but I finally made a conscious effort to do that and I'm really glad I did because we had a really good two-player game. Uh, this one is a strange one where you have to kind of manipulate your little infrastructure to suit the people and their needs. And um, it's quite a cool game where you have to kind of upgrade through these tech trees in order to kind of meet these requirements which get more and more sophisticated and even leech off other people's infrastructures. Um, it's got one of the weirdest pacings of the game that I think I've ever seen because Sometimes when you fulfill these contract cards, then they'll create new ones. And when you add more cubes to give you more kind of power to do things, um, you create more cards as well. So it has a weird curve where you kind of feel like you're drowning at times. But I would say that the more you play this one, the more that becomes manageable. And it becomes another decision of, even though you get these cards fulfilled, you do not actually have to take the benefit from them, which can actually be a winning strategy because sometimes you just want to, you know, plow towards the end of the game and not create any more cards. But Really good one, um, rock solid Martin Wallace game, and I'm really enjoying it, and it went down really well. And um, yeah, just a, just a wonderful design, really. And looking forward to seeing what else happens with that one in terms of future releases and um, content. The next game I've been playing is Acro Theory. Now, I did recently do a review of this one. This is like a pretty simple tar placement pick up and deliver game. Um, and this one is like one of the weirdest games I've had to kind of comment on because on paper, this is everything I like. Um, I love the way it looks, I love the way it feels. It's got a nice, really nice smooth gameplay. Um, but for some reason, I just do not find it terribly fun. And that's quite a weird thing for me to say because again, I can't really quite put my finger on why that is. Um, but I like it, I like the design. I would even say that, you know, check this one out if you if you need to, and maybe check out my review. But I don't know what it is, just something isn't quite clicking and it doesn't have that extra spark. Um, but I like it, but I just don't love it. And I don't think this is gonna be sticking around much longer. So that is Acro Theory. <laughs> The next game is Rattus Cartus. So we played a, another three player game of this one. I think we talked about this one briefly last month on my roundup. Um, but this one is like a push your luck style card, card game as you're collecting these cards and then kind of tributing them to climb up these tracks. But you can put in the wrong or incorrect matching cards and take these rat tokens, which might make you go bust um, by going over this rat limit, which you might or might not know uh, and learn as the game develops. Um, we had quite a strange game because the rat limit we had was like really low and it, that can happen. I think it was in like one or two rat limits and you can start with eight and there's not a lot of opportunities to get rid of them. So it's kind of like you had to make a conscious effort to absolutely plow or get rid of these rats as quickly as you could, which you know we wouldn't even know that, or just lose automatically. And that is what happened. So we kind of ended up, ended up playing a whole you know, 45 minute game um, and just losing just by default really. So it is a bit broken in that respect. Actually, I would say it was broken. I just think it's um, it can be, um, just have a really unfortunate setup with no, with no chance of modifying that. Um, and I do think that the the way that the cards come out can just massively work against you because you are constantly top decking cards without any decision or thought space. And if those cards that you have don't come out to tribute to, then you, um, you're just gonna have a bunch of cards in your hand that you can't do anything about. So that's what happened for me again for the second time. And um, I just think this is a dud of a game. It's not very good. It's very boring. Um, climbing these tracks is just, there's no spark to it at all. You're literally just climbing like five or six different tracks and hopefully you're the highest in all of them. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I would not recommend Raptors Carters. Uh, another simple game here with Pasha. So we played another three-player game of this one. This is like a a Yahtzee variant, really, by uh, Stefan Dora. And you're just simply just trying to roll um, a bunch of dice and trying to get the best kind of Yahtzee set, you know, a pair, two pairs, you know, three of a kind, four of a kind, and so on. Um, and the better kind of um, bunch of dice that you have, or the more powerful dice will get you the more points. But it does have quite a cool scoring system, you know, despite the gameplay, playing, gameplay being feather light. The scoring is quite cool because in player order, you actually play the points value that you want to play before rolling the dice. And that will determine you know, who's going to get points at the end of the round. And you know, if you know that everybody else has rolled, rolled poorly and you think you can beat it, then you can maybe play one of your higher cards. So I do like the scoring in this one. Other than that, it's really light, but it's I suppose it's reasonable fun. That is Pasha. 
We also played some six player games, starting with So Clover. So this one is a kind of word association game. And we played this one with a few people who haven't played it before. And I think they did um, struggle at points with how difficult some of these words can be because these cards orientations are so random and some of them just do not gel at all and you really do have to think outside the box and use the neighboring cards to help you and help the, your your teammates point towards that particular word you're looking for but I think people did better than they thought they were going to do and I think it again I think it went down quite well I enjoy this one I think it's just a step above games like just one it doesn't flow quite as well but it, it just adds that extra layer of difficulty I think to find the right word which I personally enjoy so I actually do like this one a lot um, it's gone down well with my family and stuff and um, I think it's a, a nice solid party game and probably one of the best party games of the last couple of years and um, it continues to impress me. We also played Fiesta de los Muertos. This is another word association party style game. Again, we played this because we had that higher player count. Uh, this one, you are basically giving clues based to um, based on a fictional or non-fictional person from history, um, and then you are thinking of a word and then passing it to your next to your person to your to your left, whatever. They'll do another word association to that. That will keep going, and then once everybody's written their words and passed them around then you are going to put them all in the middle and try to match them with these historical characters and hopefully you can link them despite it going through that funnel of multiple people. Um, and it's quite interesting the leaps you can make. You can try and backtrack on yourself and see where things have gone wrong or where things have gone right. Um, and it works quite well. You know, I don't think, it, don't think it's the best one. I don't think it's as good as games like So Clover or Just One. But if you want something a little bit different, it's, it's decent. That is Fiesta de los Muertos. A game I've been talking about quite a lot recently, especially when you have those higher player accounts, is Vabank. So we played another game of Vabank. This one is just always a good time, really. Uh, a gambling style game as you are betting on claiming these chips um, on these different tables. And you are basically um, playing three or one, well, three different cards in, in turn sequence. One of which is going to be to double the value of them. One of which is just a bluffing card. And the other one is a trap card. So if anybody lands on your trap card or the table with your trap card associated to it, then they're going to give all their money to you. And that kind of combines with the double double um, cards. So you can end up getting massive multipliers. Um, always a good time, this one, as I said. It's um, it's real kind of a ruckus game. Quite chaotic. You can't really predict with any accuracy what people are going to do, particularly when you are playing with higher player accounts. But it's a nice step away from a traditional party game and it's still a good experience, you know, regardless of that um, that chaos. So yeah, this is a good one. Nice back and, um, back and forth. You know, people who are losing end up kind of having a, a better position because they go last and you can get an educated guess of what tables people are going to. Um, I'm going to review this one soon, so keep an eye out for this one because this one is a, a massive, a great game ready that people should know about. So that is The Bunk. Uh, we also played a six player game of startups. Um, now, startups is a game that I um, that I massively uh, advocate. I think it's a great little game, a lot of stocks and shares style game. Um, but I have kind of learned the hard way now that this is not a game to be played at six players. It does not work nearly as well. You don't get um, much control over what you're getting because the uh, there's not that many cards in the deck, and when it gets back round to you as a player. Um, most of the cards have already gone and you haven't had any control to manipulate your cards. So, um, yeah, this is definitely a game that kind of um, peaks at three players for me. It's a nice, tight, really thinky experience. But the higher the player count, the more watered down it gets, which is, um, you know, quite a rare thing, thing, thing to me to say. You know, most of my games scale quite well. This one does not scale well, despite me liking it so much. So great game. I'd highly recommend it, but only when you have that maybe three or four player count. Uh, more six-player games here. We played um, The Resistance Avalon. So this is a game I haven't played for a long, long time. I can't even remember the last time I played it. This one is definitely my favourite social deduction game, and it was really nice to go back and visit this one, uh, especially with that kind of refreshed mindset. You know, we hadn't played it in a while. It felt good again, but it still felt familiar. Um, it went down really well, and we had a good little, um, good little array of characters. We had the Merlin in there, we had the Percival, and we had Mar Morgana as well. So it was quite a nice little six player arrangement and um, it created some good decisions. And uh, I think we ended up winning as the good players, but the uh, assassin was able to guess who Merlin was. Um, so, but yeah, really good game and um, still one of the best social deduction games out there. And it really re-inspired really me to go back and visit this one. So that is uh, The Resistance Avalon. 
Another uh, six-player game we played was Six Nymphed. Another chaotic game, but this one is a game that scales beautifully. So um, even at six players, uh, you think you've got loads of opportunity to put these cards down and there's the space for them, but they quickly get filled up those rows and then um, you end up taking a bunch of cards, which is what you do not want to do. So this is, for me, I always say this is like a borderline essential game, a little filler game that everybody should play at least once. Um, people might dispute the strategy and things that go into it, and maybe that is more of the case when you do play the higher player counts, but it's still fun regardless. And it's just a, a ruckus experience. Just a great, great fun game. That is Six Nymphed by Wolfgang Kramer. We also played a, another three player game of A Game of Thrones Betwixt. And I have just reviewed this one. So um, I'll be uploading that one soon, probably in the next um, day or two. Or it might even be up, uploaded by the time that this video comes out. Uh, this one is a bidding style game, obviously based on the a Game of Thrones IP. But it uses that, um, that between two cities mechanism where you are working with your neighbour uh, or your neighbours and you have your cards that you collect which are represented by all the different Game of Thrones characters um, in between you. So only your lowest of your two councils is going to be your final score. So keeping them balanced is quite, um, is quite a puzzle to manage. Um, but you are kind of playing these really aggressive cards which are quite take that -ish. they're quite nasty and can be quite unpredictable which as I normally say that's quite um, that's quite a red, uh, red flag for me normally. I don't like take that games, I don't really like games that you can't do much about the chaos. This one it seems to work quite well. Um, it's Especially when you play it more and more and more and you kind of get into the feeling of the game and you know that things are not going to go to plan then it's actually a, a really solid bidding style game with a cool scoring mechanism and I played this with two people who aren't even remotely interested in Game of Thrones and they both really enjoyed it as well. So you know, that's kind of a sign of a good game, especially when it is IP based. You know, Normally that's a massive disconnect if you don't know it, but it still went down well and um, we all had a good time. So um, check out my review for this one soon. And that is a Game of Thrones betwixt, um, you know, a good IP game. We've been playing some more, in fact, a couple of games of Capital Lux 2 Generations. So this for me is probably one of the best card games ever made. Um, this one we've been playing on the B setup, so we're using all these kind of pre-arranged pre um, tokens that you can use to change the game. And this one is a, a really good little setup, especially like this um, the, circle, the pink card ability. So whenever you play a pink card in the capital, then it counts this, this countdown timer. And when that countdown reaches five, then all of the lowest cards in the capital kind of blow up and then it will completely um, change the, uh, the pacing of the game. And you need to start building up your... Uh, building up the capital again or make sure that you don't go above them in your personal uh, in your personal town so uh, wonderful card game so much variation here and you know I'd be perfectly happy with this game even if it was just like one of the setups but the fact you have so much modularity is just great um, very impressed with this one you know always gone as done well I've never had a single bad game with this one even when you think you know, this setup doesn't seem as good as the last one it, you kind of start to learn and um, understand why that setup is particularly good. Um, it's just great. It's just a wonderful game and one that I could not recommend enough. That is Capital Lux 2 Generations. And finally, or penultimately, no, in fact, third last, I've been playing some more Barrage. So I hadn't played this one for a while, actually, despite this one being one of my favourite games of all time. I think this one ranked three out of my top um, out of my top 50 last last year um, this game is just perfection I cannot find a single fault with it I just adore everything about this big economic euro game I love the resource management as you have to tie up resources for a certain amount of time but you don't actually spend them um, I love that kind of cutthroat nature of capturing the water and building dams um, higher and higher but costing you more and more it's just an absolutely amazing game and um, you know I, I do say those kind of hyperbolic words a lot but this one I actually um, completely mean it in the literal sense it's just absolutely fantastic it's just what a game I mean I cannot praise this one enough check out my review um, it's just uh, you know I had played for a while I wondered you know was it just an initial um, bunch of plays that really caught me but going back and visiting it after playing so many other games you start to realize why these games are the greats and this one you know considering that this one only came out uh, a couple of years ago this one is, for me is one of the best games ever made that is barrage and penultimately i've been playing some more last will which i started first playing last month this is like a, a simple worker placement game but with a really cool theme as you're trying to blow um, a certain amount of money before the other players can and um, i think 
There is variable setups where you can play with different amounts of money, which will actually make the game take longer. Um, but we played with these 70, um, I think you start with 70 pounds, which is, uh, I think, just about right for me. And I think it's kind of one of the recommended amounts. And I love the actual combos of the different cards you can do here. I was kind of concerned at first whether, you know, is there going to be enough variation? Are you going to be doing the same thing every time? But when I started to kind of really play through this deck and understand all the different combos you can make, all the different paths to victory and different ways to blow that money, um, the, really, the game really does come alive. It's very simple to play and understand. I love how much you can build your little kind of tableau of characters, all of which to exploit to get rid of that money as quick as you can. And it's just a real tense, joyous experience. And um, I think this is a really good kind of entry plus level worker placement game. In fact, one of the best ones out there. So that is Last Will. Had another great game of that one. And the final game I want to talk about is King Domino Origins, which I talked about on my last roundup, I, I believe. It came quite quite high on that on that rankings. Um, but one of the comments I did make was that some of the modules, i.e. these special characters which score you uh, bonus points, I thought they were a bit superfluous and a bit unnecessary for the gameplay experience. We played this one again at three players without that and we just played with a simple domino kind of laying and the volcanoes which let you kind of spit these fireballs out to increase your multipliers. That's all we played with and for me that is where the game really shines. In simplicity, no fuss, no faff. Nothing that doesn't need to be there. Just pure, simple, family weight fun. And um, this one is a good amount of experience in a um, in a very short time frame. I made such a rookie mistake in my game by not being able to complete my 5x5 grid. But despite that, I had a really good time. And I think it's a lovely game. So that's it, really. That's all the um, all the games I've been playing in the first half of, um, of March 2022. Of course, I've been playing some new games as well. But you'll have to wait to see what those are in the monthly roundup. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please hit like and subscribe to the channel and check out my other videos too. And for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board. Bye.